My sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. Many saints have walked the earth since our Lord spoke these words. They heard his voice, they knew him, and they followed him in many and varied ways. Among the most fascinating of these ways was that taken by St. Benedict Joseph Labre. One of the reasons I became so interested in this saint is because I once heard a retreat master, he's now deceased, say that he was mentally ill. He thought that Benedict Joseph Labre was mentally ill. After hearing this, I decided to do some research and read all the books I could find on him, and we had a couple in our library at the time. The one I rely on the most for this presentation tonight is from Alban Goodyear, Bishop Goodyear. Now, the reason I became concerned is because every saint is canonized primarily because they practiced heroic virtue. That is, they were spiritually mature and in union with God, always doing His will with great generosity. They were fully developed in their personality, and that is why canonizing children can be difficult. They need time to develop and mature in the soul and spirit. If someone is mentally ill, then what is the church canonizing? The mental illness that looks like virtue? Is this possible? I thought. Would the church do this? To see my point, consider what we now call bipolar disorder. Someone who suffers from this can at times do without normal sleep for long periods of time and can perform many acts without becoming too tired. But then they crash. But this is unbalanced. Not virtue, but the effects of a mental aberration or even demonic influences. So off I went and did the research. I did a lot of research from retreats, to be honest. And what I found was a very beautiful and inspiring saint. And here is part of the story. Benedict Joseph was born on March 26, 1748 at Amiens in the Diocese of Boulogne in France. He was the eldest of 15 children. 15 children. His parents provided an education for Benedict. The account of this period furnished in the life written by his confessor, Marconi, and that contained in, uh, in the one compiled from the official processes for its beatification are at one in emphasizing the fact that he exhibited seriousness of thought and demeanor far beyond his years. See, his maturity was already present and forming in his youth. Even at that tender age, he had begun to show marked predilection for the spirit of mortification with aversion for the ordinary childish amusements. He seems, from the very dawning of reason, to have had the liveliest horror for even the smallest sin. All this, we are told, was coexistent with a frank and open demeanor and a fund of cheerfulness which remained unabated to the end of his life. This, of course, is the mark of all the saints. Perseverance and virtue all the way. As far as I can tell from all that I've read, he was not known to have suffered from any depression. At the age of 12, his education was taken over by his paternal priest uncle, with whom he went to live. During the six following years, which he spent under his uncle's roof, he made considerable progress in his studies. Most notably, he excelled at Latin and had a special love for this language of the church, but found himself unable to conquer a constantly growing distaste for any form of knowledge which did not tend toward union with God. A love of solitude, a generous employment of austerities, and devotedness to his religious exercises were discernible as distinguishing features of his life at this time and constitute an intelligible prelude to his subsequent career. At the age of 16, he resolved to embrace a religious life and spent next several years going in and out of the most strict orders of the church, the Trappists, the Carthusians, 
and the Cistercians. He remained cheerful, resolved, and hopeful throughout this trial. Even with his family and relatives pressuring him to give up and accusing him of trying to escape the responsibilities of living in the world. Get a job. Be responsible. When he was allowed to enter the Cistercians for a third try, although they admired his exactness in religious observance and his humility endeared him to the whole community, his health gave way. It was decided that his vocation lay elsewhere. In accordance with a resolve formed during his convalescence, he then set out for Rome. At this point, he wrote a letter to his parents, which proved to be the last they would ever receive from him. In it, he informed them of his design to enter one of the many monasteries in Italy noted for their special rigor of life. It was a letter full of soul and warmth. It teemed with sympathy and interest for others. It was not a word which implied bitterness or disappointment. The man who wrote it was a happy man, in no way disgruntled. Evidently, his only fear was that he may give pain to those he loved, his parents, his family. A short time after the letter was dispatched, however, he seems to have had an internal illumination about his vocation. He then understood that it was God's will that, like St. Alexis, he should abandon his country, his parents, and whatever is flattering in the world to lead a new sort of life, a life most painful and most penitential. Not in a wilderness nor in a cloister, but in the midst of the world, devoutly visiting as a pilgrim the famous places of Christian devotion. He would not be a monk like others, but he would be one after a different manner. He would not live in the confinement of a monastery. Then the whole world should be his cloister. There he would live a lonely life with God, as our Lord was during the Passion. He would be the loneliest of lonely men the outcast of outcasts, the most pitied of all pitiful creatures, a worm and no man, the reproach of men and the outcast of the people. He would be a tramp, a waif, God's own poor man, depending on whatever men gave him from day to day, a pilgrim to heaven for the remainder of his life. He would fulfill that line of scripture, They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering over deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. St. Paul's letter to the Hebrews. He was 25 years old. He repeatedly submitted this extraordinary inspiration to the judgment of experienced confessors and was told he might safely conform to it. In fact, this is one of his virtues. He took spiritual direction for his every action, always seeking to place himself under obedience to another, thereby seeking to do the will of God instead of his own. Also, whenever he spoke to priests and the learned, they were wonderfully surprised at this tramp of a man was so enlightened and deeply spiritual, they were amazed. He could relate, in other words. His personality was mature. To clarify one point before we proceed, consider my concern over the idea of mental illness and holiness or heroic virtue. The point is this. We practice virtue with God. Recall our analogy from Catechism, our tandem bicycle. God starts the movement and we direct the bicycle. There's two seats on a tandem, ourselves and God. He gives an actual grace. He gets the the pedals moving. If the person is suffering from mental aberrations, then the Lord gives healing graces to conquer this problem first not graces to perform works through the mental illness that may look like virtue. This is sound theology. 
And this was my concern in the statement made about St. Benedict's having a mental illness. Heroic virtue requires a mature and responsive personality, one that works with God in a deep union on the tandem bicycle. If someone does have a mental illness, they too can become holy and are called to do so. Make no mistake. But their heroic virtue will be exercised first and foremost in conquering the mental illness. The only time our saint seemed to experience any symptoms of what might be considered mental illness was when he forced himself a couple of times to stay with the various religious orders which was not God's will for him. He was trying to perform heroic virtue without God. The solitude, instead of giving him peace of soul that he sought, seemed only to fill him with darkness and despair. But he forced himself, and he broke down in his health. On other occasions, he lost, as I said, his physical health. The monks grew uneasy. They feared for the brain and the body of this odd young man. That is true. They told him he had no vocation, and he was dismissed. After that, he finally found his vocation. He was illuminated from above. It came from outside. No more darkness. He was guided by experts, or at least by spiritual fathers. He then wrote the cheerful and selfless letter to his parents. No mental illness here. Through the years that followed, he never wavered in the conviction that this was the path appointed for him by God. He no longer suffered from the darkness of despair or anything of ill health that plagued him every time he tried to stay in the various strict orders of the church, like the Carthusians. He had discerned the spirits. Now he was on the tandem bicycle cooperating with God. So he set forward on his life's journey, clad in an old coat, a rosary about his neck, another between his fingers, his arms folded over a crucifix which lay upon his breast. In a small pack, he carried a Bible, a breviary, and he recited daily this breviary, and a copy of The Imitation of Christ and some other pious books. Clothing other than that which covered his person, he had none. He slept on the ground and, for the most part, in the open air. He avoided inns because of their worldliness. For food, he was satisfied with a piece of bread or some herbs, frequently taken but once a day, either provided by charity or actually dug out from some refuse heap. He only asked for alms when ill and was anxious to give away to the poor whatever he received in excess of his scanty wants. As a result of his poverty, Benedict soon ceased to be clean. The smell of Benedict was not always pleasant. Even his confessor who wrote his life tells us very frankly that when Benedict came to confession, he had to protect himself from vermin. Men of taste, even those who later came to look on him as a saint, could scarcely refrain from drawing aside when he came near to them. And when they did avoid him, then was Benedict Joseph's heart full of joy. He had found what he wanted, his garden enclosed, his cloister that shut him off in the middle of the world. And the more he was spurned and ignored, the more did he lift up his eyes to God in thanksgiving. He wanted to live the life of rejection. Here we see him fulfilling the maxims of St. John of the Cross, who said, Try to act with contempt for yourself and desire that all others do likewise. Endeavor to speak in contempt of yourself and desire all others do so. Try to think lowly and contemptuously of yourself and desire that all others do the same. Once a sister called him a poor, unfortunate one, He responded, the only unfortunate ones are those in hell who have lost God for all eternity. Not so the poor of the earth. When a convent of nuns at which he occasionally visited had observed him and began to show him more interest and respect, Benedict discovered their esteem and he never went back to them again. 
Once a man, seeing him in his poverty, gave him a penny. Benedict thanked him, but finding it more than he needed, passed it on to another poor man close by. The donor, mistaking this for an act of contempt, supposing that Benedict had expected more, took his stick and gave him a beating. And Benedict took the beating without a word. We have this on the evidence of the man himself, recorded in the inquiry after the saint's death. It must be, it is just one instance of this kind. He was beaten like that regularly. He was able to keep perpetual silence as much as he was able. Those who knew him afterwards related, he seemed to go whole months together without allowing his voice to be heard. He lived in retirement and solitude. He would accept no friend or companion. He would have only God, Deus Solus. I believe that's the saying over the Trappist Monastery. When you enter in, Deus Solus. God alone. He was especially fond of 40 hours devotion. He would go from one church to another throughout the year to attend this devotion, making him a sort of perpetual adorer of the Blessed Sacrament. And he always knelt when adoring the Lord. Someone asked him about this once, seeing him kneeling for so long. And he said, I could scarcely bring myself to sit. If the seraphim veil their faces with wings before God, what should be the attitude of a worm of the earth in the presence of his majesty? The first part of the 13 remaining years of his life were spent in pilgrimages to the most famous shrines of Europe. His favorite was the Holy House of Loretto. The last six years he spent in Rome near the Colosseum, leaving it only once a year to visit the Holy House. His unremitting and ruthless self-denial, his unaffected humility, his unhesitating obedience and perfect spirit of union with God in prayer disarmed suspicion, not unnaturally aroused as to the genuineness of a divine call to so extraordinary a way of existence. You can imagine, if he were here, we'd all be looking at him with an eye, a sconce. Literally worn out by his sufferings and austerities on the 16th of April, 1783, Wednesday of Holy Week, he sank down on the steps of the church of Santa Maria dei Monti in Rome and utterly exhausted, was carried to a neighboring house where he died 35 years of age. His body was revered by all alike for the next four days. Guards had to be assigned to protect the body. The stinky body that nobody wanted to be around, they had to have guards to protect it. More honor could scarcely have been paid a royal corpse. They buried him in the church even, close beside the altar. On Easter Sunday afternoon, when the body was placed in the coffin, it was remarked, that it was soft and flexible, as of one who had just been dead. Crowds and crowds of people came for months to visit the tomb. Within three months, 136 certified cures had been worked through his intercession. You think about that. 136 within three months. We can hardly find a miracle for these modern canonizations over decades and decades. 136 certified cures in three months. Then the news spread abroad. Within a year, the name of Benedict was known all over Europe. Let us add one touching note. At this time, the father and mother, brothers and sisters of Benedict were living in their home near Boulogne. For more than 12 years, they had heard nothing of him. They had long since presumed that he was dead. Now, through these rumors, it dawned upon them very gradually that the saint whom all the world was speaking of was none other than their own son. Why did God give us this most interesting vocation, this most interesting saint? Well, because God prophesies through his saints. Prophecy has a twofold nature. It tells the truth of the time, and it speaks something of the future. St. Benedict, Joseph Labre, prophesied for his time by giving a witness that the church is in exile. The church is a perpetual pilgrim in this world. 
She's not to become too comfortable here below, lest souls lose their way. Seems to me that God wants to work through us too. He wants to show the world, especially through his religious, the value of being in exile and of being voluntarily poor. Furthermore, Benedict shows that the path of being rejected by others is a safe and purifying path, as St. John of the Cross explains so much in his writings. For it makes one look up to Christ. Like seeks like. The wounded seek the wounded one. It makes one climb. It makes one seek God. His miracles display just how meritorious a path that rejection can be. It is a sure path to endear one to Christ, if done properly. All of us experience rejection at some time in our lives. Let us keep this saint in mind and make every effort to embrace it like he did. I can tell you that it is this saint, more than most others, that has helped me endure the rejection that every priest has to face during priest scandals and during the crisis the church is passing through at this time. I've looked to St. Joseph Benedict Library and I have thanked God I read his life. Now listen to his words to those who suffer. Your state, far from exciting murmurs and regrets, should seem to you enviable. So many saints have desired to suffer as you suffer and have not obtained it. Good and ills come to us straight from God. Try to profit by one as much as the other. Prepare to endure with courage the burden of a long life of suffering, because it is a sign that in his mercy our Lord prepares an immense weight of eternal glory for you. In putting you to so heavy a trial, he wishes from you a great virtue, and he designs for you an immense reward. For I repeat, you will pass from this bed of suffering into paradise. Now, second of all, Benedict Joseph Labre acted as a type for the future of the church. The Enlightenment revolutions were just about to break out upon the world in France and other countries. All this would lead to the church losing her position of power, influence, and comfort in the various European countries, even in the whole world. Many thousands upon thousands, even in our own day, would be cast out and killed just for being Catholic. Our saint gave a sort of prophecy of this by his very life. Just as he could not stay in the religious houses, places of some comfort and stability, so too the church will be cast out of the places of comfort and stability she has long held for so long. And she would experience, and still is, rejection and scorn and poverty. Even as we speak, the church is being slowly stripped through lawsuits, heresy, schism, and apostasy. As we know from the various approved prophecies of the minor chastisement, the church, purified through this rejection, will once again take up her rightful place to be the one church of the entire world one flock and one shepherd. And that will be the age of peace, the age of Mary. Triumph of Mary's immaculate heart. Now, some of his virtues, St. Benedict Joseph also teaches us constancy. He did not relent, did not soften. He held to his principles to the end. The only time he slept in a bed was the sleep of death. How easy it is to make a great resolution but then persevering becomes heroic. St. Benedict Joseph teaches us to be humble by taking great care to hide our virtue and good works. Our age is narcissistic, craving affirmation, wanting to be noticed, paying too much attention to our talents and works and even our physique. Not our saint. He hid all as best he could even behind smells and rags and vermin, if need be. Total self-effacement. And finally, he teaches us about the value of obedience. He was loath to do anything without permission from someone. 
He had learned well from his experience in the monasteries. He tried to force himself in those situations until he was, as it were, forced to leave. From that point on, he seemed to understand the safe and meritorious path was to follow the will of legitimately established superiors. This is a prophecy and type for our time, extremely important. In this way, he completely conquered any darkness that remained. This is a hint for those who do suffer from depression or other forms of darkness. Obedience, submission of our wills to superiors may very well bring much relief and light and grace. His favorite greeting was, Praise be Jesus and Mary. May they be praised now and forever.